Welcome to DeFine, the podcast making the most important projects in crypto easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak to Johan from Chainlink. Many of you might already be familiar with Chainlink, the most widely used Oracle network, powering hybrid smart contracts and enabling DeFi across the space. Today, we dig into it. Right, so Johan, welcome to DeFine. Well, just to get started off for all of our uh, listeners, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we can we can get started a little bit into into your background and crypto specific. Perfect. Thanks for having me on. I'm currently the VP of Go to Market at Chainlink. Now, regarding my background, I got into crypto around 2016, right? And I got into this space because I was super interested in um, Ethereum at the time. I was I have a programming background, and I thought there was a lot of promises to being able to code um, basically unstoppable financial applications on top of a blockchain. So I got down the rabbit hole. I started working to crypto projects at the time, and then I joined Chainlink around 2018. Uh, because of reasons that uh, I'm sure we'll go into a bit after during the interview. Okay, amazing. Yeah, 2016. So that is quite one of the one of the early days. We've probably seen a big journey in and around crypto. But just before we dive into that, I wanted to ask. You mentioned a programming background. So how did you transition from programming into crypto and then into Chainlink? Yeah, I was very much into C sharp at the time. I was working at a company. Uh, basically programming some software for two years there. Now, I got into crypto more as a hobbyist. I was actually working on growing the community of some blockchains at the time, some of the earliest blockchains. I was um, helping host events for Ethereum meetups in Paris. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, just basically already community stuff. It wasn't any kind of uh, technical contribution at the time. Then I got really into the cross-chain world because I could see that, uh, you know, Ethereum was doing 20 GPS. As, uh, it was extremely kind of just still slow at the time, right? Even when there was nothing really built on Ethereum, <laughs> it's mm. very slow and unscalable. So I very much got into the the challenge, how do we scale this, right? And I started working for... Uh, different cross-chain solutions from, say, 17 to 19. Then I had already been aware of Chainlink since uh, the ICO, basically. Uh, but I never deep dove into it, right? And after a while, I did realize that multi-chain and uh, doing cross-chain was very key. But the yeah. most key element we needed was actually bridging real words to blockchain. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to bridge a blockchain to another, but if you think about it, there isn't much on a blockchain. There is only assets, right? While if you bridge a blockchain to the real world, then you bridge the blockchain to all the important data in the world, and then you can start building actual interesting stuff. So that's why I got into Chainlink. Um, I met uh, the team in Paris, and I met them in uh, New York because it was a time when uh, you know you had conferences every every two months, basically, <laughs> or yeah. or more. So uh, I met them, and uh, I really found them extremely on point. The stuff we were discussing at the time was uh, basically what would happen with DeFi, right? That uh, DeFi needed data, and applications needed data to actually grow and to create interesting use cases. And I wanted to help uh, build this vision. So I joined them in uh, 19. And that's really how I got into the team. Okay, amazing. That's, that makes a lot of sense. So you really you took the thesis of bridging, let's say, the on-chain world with all of the interesting data that exists, not necessarily off-chain, but in the traditional world. And so is that what led you to your specific role at Chainlink as well? Yeah, that's really it. So... The big motivator for me was, and I'm sure you remember 2017, you had all of these great ideas, right? All of these projects were coming up and you had thousands of white papers and everyone was saying, hey, let's uh, decentralize the world. Let's uh, bank the end bank or unbank the bank. Yeah, yeah. On, uh, <laughs> Lots of ideas about everything. Not necessarily all of them good though. Yeah, and when you started diving into it, the only data 
and no one was actually answering this answer in the white papers. How mm. do I get this data? So how do I create the next Uber? Why do I, how do I create the next Airbnb? How do I create the next bank? None of these folks and companies were actually talking about data. And I think at the time, they were all confused about how to get this data, actually. You see, you are not mentioning it. It was a time when, uh, you know, you could put anything in a white paper and people would believe it. Uh, and you could have thousands of holes, but, you know, no one would catch a question on it. Yeah. So, that, that's really how I got into Shelling is because it was answering this big question I had every time I was reading a white paper on how is this even possible? How are you even going to do this? You, you don't have the, the data from the real world. The blockchain world is completely siloed. Yeah, yeah. So in in that sense, you really you had like a thesis driven approach into entering crypto, and through your daily contributions, you were essentially trying to solve for this walled garden, as it's described often. Is that is that what Chainlink is to you? If if you had to explain it in a few sentences, is Chainlink the bridge between the walled garden and the rest of the world? Yes, Chainlink is the onboarding tool for traditional finance, for traditional insurances, every kind of industry to actually get into the blockchain in one form or another. That's mm -hmm. really what you need, because if you don't have data from the real world, the only thing you have is uh, tokens, which you can trade and uh, do stuff with, but not much else on the blockchain, right? Gotcha. So that's what the link is to me. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. So could you could you tell us a little bit about that? So how does how does Chainlink bridge? You know, we hear a lot about oracles and, and keepers and everything else, but I think many people don't have a clear and concise overview about what an oracle is and why it's so profound for enabling DeFi. Yeah, definitely. Now, there are three things involved in a good... Um, price delivery, can not price delivery, but uh, data delivery system, right? There is the Oracle, there is the data provider, and there is the actual DUN. We call it DUN. It's basically a decentralized Oracle network. Uh, it's, so it's um, the, the grouping of multiple Oracles together. Now, the Oracle is quite simple. It's if you want to provide data on Ethereum, let's say, you need someone who's operating, and this someone could be a node, it could be uh, an organization, it could be an individual. You basically need an entity to be running a full Ethereum, um, a full Ethereum node, and a Chainlink node. Okay, because this entity needs to know the state of Ethereum to be able to put data on it and to be able to know when to put data on it. Then you need a data provider. Based on the data that uh, the smart contract will need, you need the node operator to be speaking to data provider to get this data. So you need an API endpoint to be able to access the, the data that needs to be delivered. Okay. The third one, which is the most important one, is the done. You need an entity, you need a coordination mechanism across multiple nodes to be delivering the same data. Uh, so basically, the done is a regrouping of the Oracle entity I was talking about. And the reason it's very important is if you don't have this done, then you rely on a single Oracle. And there you obviously have a point of failure into your application if you're using a single Oracle, right? So what Chenning did was we've been looking always at one thing. It's how do we enable this space to happen, right? So at the time in uh, 19, when we already started working on uh, launching DONs and supporting the space this way, what people needed and what people actually still need today are price feeds. They needed to get the price of multiple tokens or even of commodities or FX currencies to be able to create different applications around them, you see? So what we did was we worked to, to get node operators to start running Chainlink nodes. And we started putting these node operators with data providers to start putting uh, crypto data or FX and uh, commodity data on chain. And then we started working on organizing these dons together in a way where our users would be able to get the data they needed. So let's say, 
um, synthetics needed to get data for commodities or crypto, they would be able to leverage these dons to get whichever data they wanted to get uh, from now on. So that's that's really what we worked on at the time. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. That's pretty pretty amazing. So it, it makes a lot of sense in the sense about what you were saying before, connecting or enabling larger players such as insurance providers or huge you know funds to enable the power of the the blockchain whilst using the data from the real world. What I would like to ask about is those data providers. Who are they and how do you guys connect the node operators and the data providers? Is this something you you actively engaged in building out a chain link in the early years? Yes. Yeah, so on our side, we've been um, as as Chainlink Lab, right? We've been working mainly as a coordinator entity, which is node operators are completely third parties and data provider are also third parties, right? So our role was connecting the two. Um, these data providers for crypto prices are actually folks you know, they're CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap, and many others. I think we have around seven to nine for data providers um, on crypto prices, uh, crypto compare. So they're entities which are interested also in the prospects of putting data on chain, because it's also a new revenue opportunity for them, you see? Yeah, And on our side, the job was really coordinating uh, the node operators who needed data and the data providers who wanted to sell the data, who wanted more kind of uh, markets to sell this data. You see? Yes, that makes sense. And could you tell us a little bit about those early years scaling or uh, I guess encouraging people to be onboarded as those third parties? Uh, ensuring that you know they had a high level of service provision in order to enable Chainlink. What were some of the things that you do? Did you focus on grants, or you know, was it more of like a liquidity mining thing? Was it consulting? Well, actually, at the time, uh, <laughs> at the time in two thousand, like when we did this in nineteen, um, we didn't need grants. We mm. did not need liquidity mining, and there was actually no liquidity mining in the good old days. <laughs> so you, you didn't have this whole uh, yield war, which, <laughs> oh, wow. which exists now. What, what was the point of crypto then? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, no 2,000% APY. What is this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, it, it was very simple. Every actor had an incentive here. Node operators would be making uh, uh, revenue by selling data to smart contracts. Data providers would gain access to a bigger market. And smart contract applications like GFI um, DAPs that you know today, like uh, Synthetix, Aave, Ampleforce, all of these folks needed better Oracle mechanisms uh, because you know either they didn't have one or they had one which, um, which was maybe too centralized. Uh, now, Everyone was aligned on the incentives uh, for them to actually participate in this. I would say the biggest struggle at the start was explaining uh, to DeFi projects, and some of them got it very quickly, like Synthetix has always been one of the easiest projects and you know really um, forward-looking projects in the space uh, I've known at least. And uh, Ave also, like these folks were really they knew what would happen in the future, basically. They had a very good view and they knew they would need decentralized oracles, right? However, um, at the time, there was still a lot of push for us to be able to convince projects that they should not be relying on centralized oracles and what the reasons were, right? Reasons which today might seem obvious uh, to us in the crowd or in the crypto space were not so obvious at the time. So I would yeah, say- uh, Sorry, could you just tell us a bit about those reasons? Well, today it's very easy to see that um, smart contract for DeFi is two things. It relies on two big things. It relies on, on a blockchain and it relies also on Oracle data, right? Um, it relies on a decentralized Oracle network providing data to your smart contract. That's how probably 90% of the DeFi contracts you'll see today are structured. They have this part, which is blockchain part, and they have this Oracle part. At the time, a lot of people were not too sure what this Oracle part was and how it should look. Uh, they knew the blockchain part. Okay, that was fine. That's either Ethereum or something else. But this Oracle part, 
it wasn't clear to many projects how much reliance they would actually have on it, you see? Uh, it wasn't clear that in order to get a system which would be end-to-end -end secure, they would need an Oracle network, which is uh, as decentralized or at least a minimum decentralized compared to the blockchain that they are using as well, you see? Um, and that you couldn't have only one Oracle providing you data as it would be kind of a centralized risk, right? Like this stuff is obvious mm -hmm. for today. At the time, these parts were still getting together. G5 was just getting built. A lot of projects were just basically pioneers, right? We were making stuff as we went because we were the first ones doing it and they were trying to see what would work, you see? That's the main reason. It was discovery, basically. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for for taking us on that journey. I think we have a we have a clear image of at least what what Chainlink is and why it provides such a compelling offering for for DeFi. But I do just want to dig in a little bit to the problems that you solve for, but also other people solve for, and where the Chainlink difference comes in. So what makes Chainlink so special? You know, we always hear about you being the main Oracle provider for, for price feeds. And now you're entering this sort of, I guess, like the keepers ecosystem. What is it like a development methodology you guys have at Chainlink? Is it because you saw things before people did? Like, in your opinion, what makes Chainlink so special? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think the real big reason, and obviously there are a few reasons. We have a very good engineering team. We have a lot of uh, development and the security going into our products. We have a lot of uh, great researchers like Ari Jules and many others who are kind of top class uh, researchers in the world. The other big reason I see in my view is uh, we've worked with thousands of projects in the space for price feeds, for randomness, for keepers. We have talked to an incredible amount of developers of projects. We've discovered many use cases We've helped architect a ton of use cases. Um, I don't think any other project has had as much exposure as we've had into um, new use case and actually supporting developers to secure real world like uh, value uh, on blockchain. Because for us, it's very simple. We're a protocol, meaning we're not limited to Ethereum. We're not limited to Solana. We are on more than 10 to 12 chains. Uh, I think we're on 14 blockchains today. Meaning every new use case which comes up on Avalanche or, um, or Ethereum or Arbitrum, we have the potential to help it. We have the potential to provide support for developers if they need price data, if they need keepers, if they need VRF. And because of that, we have a huge amount of exposure to what people actually need in this space. Uh, Chainlink, if you want to summarize what we're trying to do, we're trying to enable developers build the new set of uh, DeFi application or decentralized application in the space. To do that, we need to know what the developers need, right? And because we had so much exposure, in my view, we've been able to really work on what their priorities are and always, always favor what is the most key element to devs. Uh, a lot of it is a security, but there are other elements these folks favor, and we are able to know this stuff in advance because we're supporting uh, during the, the whole journey for these developers. You see? Yeah, I, I I do see that. I think not only in in what you said, but also just working with Chainlink, particularly with the price fees that we use from our options to you know looking at some of the stuff we've recently integrated around the the keepers for the new liquid locker architecture it's it's quite clear you guys already have answers it seems for almost everything and a clear process in place and no that's obviously not by mistake you know this is uh, you guys have put in the hard yards to be able to have those and yeah it's been a it's been a pleasure to work with i think it's it's also a very noble thing how you're looking to onboard uh, developers into the ecosystem and really keep this um, value first ethos um, yeah, it's uh, it's really special. I think one of the things that we all do see around Twitter, particularly if you're not building, you're just you know focused on, let's say, the community side of crypto. You always hear about the the Link Marines and this like great 
army of, of supporters that Chainlink has has amassed who, who clearly see the future. Could you tell us a, a bit about what you guys have done to curate that community and, and how you how you service them as well? So for this one on my side, I've really been on the user side. Um, what I've noticed is, uh, I, I, I'll share my general impressions on uh, crypto communities if that works for you. Um, yeah, definitely. I think for ourselves, what we've seen with our community, like with many communities in crypto, was a very organic uh, kind of growth, which is basically, um, I was talking about this kind of revelation I had uh, when I discovered Chainlink a few years ago, right? Which is, I was reading a ton of white papers and none of them made sense because I never got this part about how do you actually get data on chain, right? Um, I wasn't the only one who got this uh, big trigger, obviously. A lot of people were like, oh, wait, Chainlink is the missing piece of the puzzle for this uh, blockchain thing to actually take off. Like You need actual real-world data if you're going to create a lot of these cool applications, right? I think a lot of very smart people got into this um, uh, community because they believed a long time ago already in the vision. And they got very excited by the vision and they started writing articles and blog posts and contributing on uh, socials because they thought this would be the future and they believed in crypto. And they saw that Chainlink was actually enabling crypto and the blockchain vision to take shape. So that's what I saw with our community. Now, as far as uh, what we're doing to support and all, I'm not too exposed to this side of the of the kind of um, work, right? I'm more on the really user side and uh, making sure we enable developers and all of this stuff. But I think a community like this, which believes in a vision, doesn't actually need a lot of enablement. It just needs to see that we're doing the work that you're supporting the ecosystem, because in the end, that's the vision they believe on. A blockchain ecosystem, which uh, thrives, which is able to get access to real-world data, and which is able to build cooler and cooler use cases to actually really create this decentralized vision we all believe in. I'd agree with that. I think it's really exciting to, to see that part of our crypto as well. You see all of these other people who... Let's say, like, let's take your example. You and the chaining team just had an idea, and and they saw the future. And suddenly, you get this rising tide that just lifts you, and it's a it's a constant source of motivation. It's very, I think, it's very unique to the crypto space. It's probably most aligned with like sports clubs, and yeah, it's a it's a tremendously special thing about crypto. Just for them, and also our listeners, could you tell us a little bit about where you guys are heading in the future? You know, you've always been so good at identifying what's next, what's what's exciting, what's going to be needed in two, three, four, five years from now. So could you could you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking with that mindset today? Yeah, for sure. There is a ton of stuff which is going to be probably evolving in the crypto space. I think now more than ever, we need to keep um, supporting the DeFi ecosystem. Because the way I'm looking at it right now, uh, there is probably going to be a lot of changes in the world, kind of uh, order and the way systems actually work. Um, I think more than ever, people will need a decentralized uh, financial system in any country they're in. People are going to have uh, hyperinflation to be confronted to some very tough realities which I think our friends in Argentina already got a few years ago, right? That's why DAI was taking off so much in Argentina and the other stable coins. So for us, first focus is going to really stay. Uh, we need to keep supporting DeFi and that goes with price feeds, that goes with uh, keepers, that goes with supporting more and more blockchains because currently people are betting on the multi-chain world to be able to scale this whole ecosystem. So that's the first priority. I think the, the big moves that are going to happen in the world are going to push more and more people towards DeFi. That's, uh, that's uh, currently the, the assumption. So the second one is we've seen a lot of very interesting stuff with uh, blockchain gaming. Um, it's very likely that there will be a few kind of um, games which really take off in the space. 
and that really gets success. Now, gaming does need uh, randomness by default. Many games need some kind of randomness generation. And that's also another big bet we have. We want to be able to support the new gaming applications, which will be coming up, which will be kind of uh, needing super high frequency randomness in their game, right? I think that's a very good um, that's a very good value add to the space. If you look at games currently, there is a huge uh, kind of opportunity to actually disrupt this space because there is a ton of stuff which is extremely opaque where you know you have randomness, but you don't know how the randomness work. So that's another big area I'm, uh, I'm quite excited about. The other one is CCIP. CCIP because it's a multi-chain world and chains are going to have to communicate between one and another. Uh, there needs to be a way to actually uh, connect all of these blockchains to make sure that, let's say, a protocol like Aave, which is on multiple blockchains, is able to connect their multiple instances together. Where, let's say, you have the protocol voting on Ethereum, uh, then it should be able to impact uh, the Polygon instance or the Avalanche instance, you see? Overall, lots of big changes in the world, lots of uh, volatile times. We want to support DeFi because we we do think that DeFi will be needed more than ever uh, in this in the kind of uh, world of tomorrow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in particular, what you called out at the cross chain world, and you know, there's a lot of really interesting and exciting developments around ZK rollups and potentially having even the other way around. So you you sign something or you execute a transaction on Polygon and it's relayed back onto mainnet and influences the gauges or for instance with with our architecture we have the majority of our lockers on on mainnet you know enabling users to vote with their let's say ve token power on mainnet and influence gauges elsewhere across the crypto ecosystem that's tremendously exciting in the context of chainlink what are some of the challenges with regards to enabling that uh, cross-chain architecture. I think I think the main challenge is really uh, there are so many priorities right now we have to work on. Right, it's a multi-chain world. It's a price feed. It's all of this stuff. Um, mm. It's really putting in the work to to create this kind of uh, solution, which would be up to our standards. Right, and we've done a lot of progress there, but there is still much to do to be able to get this going. Otherwise, otherwise there is no real blocker or challenge I can see. It's mainly really being able to prioritize among the high number of things we have to deliver. Because for our side, we always try to accommodate the space, right? And the challenge with accommodating the space is we need to accommodate the short term and the long term, you see? So we need to balance what we do on a day-to-day -day basis because you might have users coming up to us who need uh, short term. Uh, when I say user, I mean developers. Uh, mm -hmm. Developers coming up to us with a short term kind of uh, um, request that they need, right? They need us to enable some kind of uh, request and uh, we build it for them and we help them or we help them at least architects. Um, but then we have to balance all of these short term priorities, which we, we have to work on to basically help uh, these developers with the long-term ones, which is how do we actually provide a ton of value in the next uh, one to two years, right? So that's really been the main challenge we've been facing. Uh, it's a good challenge because in any case, we get exposure to devs and their issues, and we're able to get better and better at solving them. But um, yeah, a challenge nonetheless. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of a lot of teams are seeing that. So is the strategy for Chainlink to continue to scale both on in terms of like service provision is to increase the power of execution or enhance the the volume of execution so are you are you guys like actively hiring at the moment or putting out like lots of trainings and upskilling uh, measures in place yes yeah, so we're still hiring uh, for the engineering team for sure we we want to grow this team we want to make sure we can keep delivering on this side on the uh, building side, volume side. And the second priority is obviously prioritization. Uh, so it's really scaling the team, prioritization. We already have a very high amount of engineers. We want to make sure we have even more 
to be able to support for the more use cases and more devs in the future. Yeah, definitely. I think I think Chainlink is probably one of the one of the largest teams I've seen in terms of engineering talent. And yeah, like really looking forward to see that grow in the future. It, you know, it's been it's been really exciting to uh, to learn a little bit about the start of your experience, your journey into crypto, and also see and and learn a little bit more about what makes Chainlink so profound for DeFi. So I just want to thank you on behalf of all of DeFi and the team and our listeners for coming on and taking us on that journey with you. And just before I think we we let you go and and do some more important stuff for enabling DeFi, just want to want to let you introduce anything that we haven't had the opportunity to discuss or maybe just say a, a hello to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it was an absolute pleasure to be on uh, this podcast. I think the space is going through some interesting times. Um, in my experience, what I've seen from before is this is actually going to be an amazing time to be building stuff. Um, I think this is going to be a time with much less noise, much less hype, with a much more realistic view of the future, right? And we mm. should highly, highly value these times. That's when stuff actually gets built. Everything that got built is, uh, we could call it crypto cycle, is from the last cycle. Everything that got success, DeFi, even uh, blockchains like uh, Solana, all of these, they didn't pop up this cycle. They were here during 2018, 2019, when there was much less noise. And I think right now I would encourage the devs to come and uh, check out Chainlink, what we're doing, what we're working on, because this is going to be the time to actually build some really great stuff to potentially change uh, the world of tomorrow when the next uh, kind of uh, crypto cycle, I guess we could call it, comes. I think that's really the time. Work, don't pay attention to the noise. It's going to be uh, a very good time to actually build uh, the real stuff which matters and which can have an impact on the world. Yeah, really well said. Really well said. Yeah, Ignore the noise, come and build the future. Amazing. Thanks so much, Johan, for, for joining us. And we will come back to you uh, hopefully in the future at some point. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me on.